Now, I want to give you another quick update. This is the time of year that we are usually gearing up for our annual prom for folks with special needs known as Night to Shine. Um, those of you that are tracking or familiar with it, maybe you're new and you don't know what that is, every February around Valentine's Day, we do a massive prom up in the school's gym for folks with special needs. It's really a highlight of our year, but as you may figure, um, the Tebow Foundation, who we partner with, is not really allowing that to happen again this year for gathering and results of, of the pandemic and all the things for that particular population. So what we are doing is we are working on creating smaller pockets and giving you all opportunities to get plugged in to serve this community throughout the entire month of February, whether that may be volunteering on a Saturday with what the Y does with its Challenger program, having athletics for kids and with special needs through Young Life, Compernium, uh, making some phone calls there with our, our friends at Bright Futures and Care. So we're trying to give you a bunch of places where you could get involved and it'd be our heart that we just kind of blanket the community with some love throughout the months of, month of February in this way. So be on the lookout for that. Stay plugged in with what's going on online for that. The second quick update, if you've been around here much, um, you would know that I rarely, if ever, talk about money. Don't worry, I'm not going to today. That's not going to be like kick off the new year. Um, but I do want to give you a quick update just to let you know where we are kind of through our first six months of the fiscal year to let you know and celebrate that our giving right now uh, as a church family is about 7% above our budget. Um, so that's something to celebrate. Yeah. yeah, all right. I mean, yes. Yay, God. Yay, you. And it's less than 1% above last year. So... If we measure how much you like, like what's happening, I'm just kidding. Like it's less than 1% more than last year. I'm just kidding. So I just want you to know that. And I want to give you that update to say this, like we, like we don't talk, I don't talk about it a whole lot because in my heart, I think that that's a source of a lot of hurt for us and then a lot of spiritual abuse and a lot of guilt and a lot of whatever. And I just believe as we get healthy in our souls, as we get our community right and our mission right and our alignment with God, like generosity in all of its form flows from that. Our life, our time, our homes, our finances, our resources, all of that. And so it just flows from general, generous hearts. And my prayer is not that we quote unquote give more money this year. My prayer is that we become the kinds of people who see our lives as a stewardship from God on his mission that we live more generously with our entire life and God will sort out the finances for each and every one of us individually. Does that make sense? And so this isn't like a, the sky's falling star giving. This is just, here's where we are and the call for us is to become the kinds of people who are generous with our entire lives. And that looks different for each and every one of you. So I just want to give you that that sort of update. And I want to lead you in what something I'm probably going to bring out about once a month to remind us of God's call in this new year to be more generous with our entire lives. And I want to offer this prayer for us. And you can just read it. You can witness it. I just want to pray it out loud with you today to help us center our hearts on that. And it says this, Father, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing that I have that you have not given me. And the way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help me to honor you with my resources. Free me from the deceit of riches and lead me on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of my own life and for the sake of others. And everyone said, amen. amen. And let's not talk about money for a while again. All right. You had a good Christmas, a good New Year's. Um, I want to speak today on this first Sunday for us of the new year um, before we kick it back into the Sermon on the Mount next year from the subject called Seek First. Can you say that? Seek First. Seek First. And Eliza and I, over the break, we had one of those days where we cleaned out our closets. It was beautiful. And by the end of the day, um, we had blessed Goodwill with every almost every piece of clothing that I owned. And I looked at our, my closet, and that's a good thing because of some changes we made last year. And I had like four shirts and two pairs of pants left that fit and I was willing to wear publicly. And so um, we decided it's time to go to the mall and re-up our fashion game and just close because I can't wear the same thing every first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth day. That would be embarrassing. So we went to the mall. We walked in, and I knew that I wanted to go to American Eagle because now I can shop there and buy off the rack like I used to in high school before I pa 
packed on um, sadness. And then, um, and so, <laughs> so it's been so long I could go to that sort of store. Um, I didn't know where it was anymore. And so we walked in the Barbersville Mall through the food court and we did what every lost wandering soul does at the mall. We looked for the mall directory. And we were, we were just so appreciative of the fact that someone decided to put a map up that said with a little red dot, you are here. And we noticed where we are and we looked and we found American Eagles down the corridor and, and we went there and Eliza got her rings cleaned and they look so good. You're welcome. Um, and on our way to the store and we went, we shopped, we did the whole thing. We went home, we tried it on and I've got these fancy ripped jeans on and it looks so fashionable apparently. By the way, why is fashioning returning to the night? My wife is wearing a corduroy baggy jacket today like it's cool. I don't Help me understand. Help me understand what's happening. But here's the deal. On that journey, my need was remedied. I was able to find what I needed because I first was able to locate where I was starting. You are here. And here's the deal. What's tr what was true at the mall that day is true about our entire lives. That it's hard to know where to go unless you first know where you are. Fair enough? And the start of the new year brings with it the opportunity to reflect and grow and think about who I am and where I belong and what I'm doing with my life and what changes can be made. And so it, it, it's like this built-in moment that we kind of plot our lives on some sort of internal map that tries to get honest about some things, about where we are and where we want to go, who we are and who we want to become and why we are the way we are for better or for worse. And then all of us, with varying levels of resolve and stick to itness, we're inspired to change and to grow and to ask new questions and strengthen relationships and put up healthy boundaries and others and to take some risks and make some moves to get unstuck, to get healthier, to do the work of healing. And the list can go on and on and on according to your own story. We're always trying to come up with long term change, um, come up with something better than just short term goals that fade away. So on this first Sunday for us back together, I, I want to do something that's a little bit different, less teaching, and end with like space to reflect, where I'm going to invite you to like take out pen and paper if you still own those things, or a phone and take some notes and listen and pray and reflect. But I also want to amp you up a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to be less teachy, Professor Matt, and be more like, come on, let's take the hill together. I'm going to be less nuanced than I normally am. I'm going to give fewer disclaimers and just say, let's go all in. And so we're, we're going to have that sort of thing where I want to do three things. One, I just want to help you map your life. I want you to be able to internally have that moment that says, here's where I am, here's who I am. And then I want to invite you to get real and honest and vulnerable with yourself that you can just kind of check where you're heading with it. Check your trajectory. He check the direction you are heading in with your life. And then third, invite the Holy Spirit to give you some course corrections if that's needed. Make sense? Is that cool? And so our text comes from a single verse from the Old Testament. It's a beautiful poem. It's kind of a sad poem, but there's some happy mixed in, written by Jeremiah called Lamentations, and it's from verse 3, verse 40, where Jeremiah says this. He says, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Three things immediately jump out to us. The first is those first two words, let us. Let us return. Let us examine. Let us probe our ways. And the invitation to reflection and mapping of our life and seeing where it can go today, uh, I want you to know that while the ending will be kind of individualized, like it is inherently a thing that we do together. Let us examine our pro and probe our ways. Why? Because your life and my life and your apprenticeship to Jesus, even during what may feel like an individualized day, it's not actually meant to be or best fully expressed as an individual journey. It is not an individual effort. And you will not best understand yourself and where you are going or why you are going there all by yourself. Look to your left and to your right and in front of you and behind you like we need one another. I need you. You need me. And the same is true in every relationship in this room and outside of this room. And the next thing is this. 
Let us examine and probe our ways. The second thing that sticks out to me is this idea of examination and probing like the way we are living our lives. And here's the deal. What you do with your life, your relationships, your time, your sense of purpose in the world, even your, the way you parent and relate to your spouse, the way that you are living fully in your singleness or widowing, whatever you, wherever you are, it all flows out of why you do what you do. Your what flows from your why. Like if you want to see your life change and grow and you want to see your life take on some new sense of meaning and purpose and new levels in this new year, uh, I would encourage us, don't try to just change your behavior, but get to the root that is informing why you do what you do, why you think the way you do, why you have the hurts that are in need of healing that you need, why you have the questions that you have, good like, it's not a judgment of the questions. It's just a question that says why, and then we can get after the heart of it. And let's be honest for a second. For the most part, what you and I attach value to, what you love, um, what's worth something to you, in the deepest parts of your being, like, that is what actually dictates what you do with your life. It's actually where you attach value to things and people and ideas. That, that's actually what drives what we do. And so there's a journey in there of discovering that and living in alignment with it. But, but can we be honest a little bit about the last two years? Um, I think it's really interesting. Pressure and stress and disruption and change, they're not tests on our lives as much as they are like revealers of what's in there. Um, when life gets hard, it doesn't usually create a moment where you do what you've never done before. It creates a moment where what's in you leaks out. It, it can't help but leak out. You put pressure and stress into your life, who you actually are gets revealed. And that's a big deal for us. And that's really key when we want to say we are wholeheartedly following and apprenticing with this Jesus of Nazareth and his way and living our lives in light of the kingdom. We're becoming a church family together and we are inviting people into our lives, into our homes. And we're, we're trying to just go all in on this thing that Jesus is offering us and he's super serious about what is actually in us leaks out. And so it's about getting not at behaviors for when life is easy, but it's actually about looking at the core level examination probing of our ways is about asking questions of our why that flow from our heart. This is an invitation to reflect on what is in the innermost parts of your being that drives everything else. And so when you think about reflection, one, that may be a totally foreign concept to you, you may be thinking things like, does he mean breathing exercises and mindfulness and yoga? Does he mean just like looking inwardly and hating everything about me? Does he mean like looking at my past with regret and shame? Does he, what, what do I mean by that? Well, let me help you. One, one thing that I do not mean is that reflection is an invitation to shame. It's not an invitation towards your regret. It's not an invitation to go relive and rehash out all your hurt and all your unforgiveness and all your bitterness and all the bad because reflection with, filled with shame and pain and hurt and regret is, is not ultimately healthy. It may be part of the journey, but it's not the whole goal. The kind of reflection that we're invited into is one not marked with regret, but one marked with redemption. Redemption, and those are two very different approaches to this life of reflection. And to reflect redemptively means, check this out, see if this lines with your story, I would imagine it does. To reflect redemptively means that you recognize that there is nothing in your life that God can't use for good. There's nothing in your life that God can't use for good. And then the third quick thing that is in this text that just jumps off the page for me is that, notice this, let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. Meaning what? I want you to see the connection, that ultimate, that the ultimate purpose of examining our lives is to consistently return to the God who made you and loves you and has your future laid out in front of you. The purpose of reflection is not to beat yourself up. 
The purpose of reflection is not to get like more inner focused on you and your feelings. The purpose of reflection is to navigate all that, take all of it into the landscape of your life and your soul and your health and say, God, it is you that I find. Let me return to you. And can you just redeem and change every part of this thing that is my experience? The entire purpose is of finding God finding his purpose, finding what he says about who you are, and finding where he is working and joining him there. There's a beautiful relationship here, a connection between self-reflection and connection to God. Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. So what is God asking? What, are we, what am I asking? I think this is provoking us to at least ask a few questions. The one is like, what am I seeking? What am I seeking? Who am I seeking? And then what impact does how I answer those questions bear on why, on the why behind everything that I do? And again, in just a few minutes, we're going to give a little bit of space to enter that. And it's going to get awkward. There's going to be people come in dressed in robes, and they're going to help you lead. I'm just, whoa, that's not true. <laughs> We're going to get the salt rocks out. Um, and, like, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Like, these are, these, are really get, these are really foundational, fundamental questions. And I'm praying that in some way, like, you're going to experience something that's a bit of trajectory changing and course correcting, some clarifying things. For, like, for some of you, it will be, like, introducing new questions into your life. For some, it might be coming to peace or clarity regarding something you've wrestled with for a really long time. For some, it will lead to immediate actions and with immediate results. And for others, in my experience, this is most of us, it will be just the start of breaking up some fallow ground in our life and beginning to work the soil of our hearts and maybe planting something new and seeing the harvest some way in the future. The question underneath many of the other questions that you're invited to is like, who or what are you am I seeking with my life? But let me flip the script. What if there's a different question, a better question, a different angle on the same question? It's a question we rarely ask when it comes to our lives, and it is this. What is God seeking? Instead of what am I seeking, what is God seeking? See, God is a seeking God. There's things that he wants. There's things that he's looking for. And can I just say, like, at the start of this new year and as we ramp back into all that God has for us in this year as a church family together where there's healing and help and growth and change and formation and mission and purpose and all the things that God has in front of us, this is the real difference maker. What is God seeking? God is seeking your whole heart. God is seeking your whole heart. He's looking for people whose hearts are fully his. He's looking for wholehearted people. And I mean, isn't this the question, if you've been with us, like, isn't this the question we've been asking for about six months as we've worked through the Sermon on the Mount? And we framed it as if, like, what if Jesus was serious? Spoiler alert, he's pretty serious. The real question is, are we Are we serious about what Jesus is laying out in front of us? And so I want to give a quick disclaimer, like, quick disclaimer, again, and for the guy that likes to nuance everything, that's hard for me. I'm only doing one today. So if you need more coffee and conversation and nuance, let's talk, but that's not today. Like, don't equate, when I say this, and we flesh this out for a second, don't equate wholeheartedness towards God with having everything together. That makes sense? Don't equate wholeheartedness, meaning you have everything figured out. All your hurts are now healed. All your questions are now gone. All the past is just somehow no longer regret and shame, but it is good, and you see God's goodness at it. Don't equate wholeheartedness with no suffering and no difficulty and no loss. Equate it with something else. Because it's for, me, for us, it's far more about effort. What I mean by wholeheartedness is far more about effort and direction and trajectory than performance or perfection. Wholeheartedness is far more about like where you are heading, the bearing of your life, what it is aligned under and who is informing who you are and why you do what you do rather than all the stuff 
that looks like performance and pressure and stress and religiosity and words and what to do and what not to do. It's about trajectory. And the good news is, is that you're broken, like you're broken, partially torn, a bit fragmented, steeped in doubt, insecure and anxious heart that is right inside of you. Like he's not asking for some sort of self-remedied fake perfection before he'll take all of you. He's just asking like, come after me wholeheartedly. I want your whole heart, your whole life. I want all of you. I made you and I have a plan for you and I love you and there's nothing so broken that I can't fix or love you through. He's simply saying, give me all of it. Bring your whole life and watch what I will do with it. Is it always convenient or easy or quick or pain-free? No, it's not. It's not even close to that, so don't buy that. But, but it is something else. And here's what I just hear him saying to us today. Like, I hear him like whispering to some of you, screaming at others. Like, you've never understood your identity like you will on the other side of wholeheartedness. You've never understood or felt what true healing is like like you will on the other side of wholeheartedness. He's saying, you've never seen your life and the part you play in the world so clearly as you will on the other side of wholeheartedness. And he's saying to you and he's saying to me, leave your misguided thoughts about performance and perfection behind. Bring me all of you, your failures, your doubts, struggle towards me, press through the pain towards me, bring me your whole heart. I gave you mine when you had nothing to give in the first place because this isn't a transaction for me, this is love. And I want you, I want all of you. But here's my sense. This is, this, this is my sense. This is my read on the struggle in this that's beneath all the other struggles. This is like when the problem's not the problem, there's always a problem underneath the problem. This is the actual problem. Did you track that? <laughs> Here it is. That the struggle is that you've taken a half-hearted approach with a wholehearted God. That feels really judgy and harsh. What, like, hear my heart in it. I'm not going to nuance it for you because some of us need, just need to hear we can't give half-heartedness to a wholehearted God. We, you, you wouldn't do that in your, like in your marriages, right? Like give half-hearted effort and love and affection and commitment and covenant and passion and intimacy and all the things to your spouse? That doesn't go great. Like it doesn't go great. Um, you do that at your job. It, it will be temporary. Like, you do that in your effort at a healthy diet, it, it will be short-lived. All the things, like, half-heartedness does not lead to wholehearted results and change and formation and growth. The struggle is that have we taken a half-hearted approach to a whole-hearted God? And let me tell you, it is a tragedy to give half-heartedness to God. It's an actual tragedy. It's an actual tragedy. It's not just, like, good, better, best. It's an actual tragedy because... The longer, the longer things are half-hearted, the further the drift is, the further out of alignment there is. And I don't mean that in some religious behavioral metric. I just mean, like at the core of who you are, the more half-hearted your approach is to a wholehearted God, it, it just, things get a little off. And again, and I don't mean that by like some sort of perfection and performance and that there's not legitimate hurt and healing and questions and doubts. We're here for a lifetime to work through all that. But let's go after it wholeheartedly. Let's go after the remedy wholeheartedly. Let's go after God and his mission wholeheartedly. Let's go after your healing and your restoration and, and your less anxiousness and less worry in your life. Let's go after those things wholeheartedly. Have you ever tried to do a backflip? Anybody ever tried to do a backflip? Is there anybody, Jordan, Jordan could stand up and do one, like rip it off like some freak of nature. Um, but I don't want you to rip your jeans in front of everybody. That'd be embarrassing. Um, like, have you ever tried to do a backflip? I tried. Off a diving board, into water, thought it'd be soft. Not soft. Here's the thing I learned about trying to do a backflip. You have to commit to that thing or you're going to break your neck. Like, you're going to tumble over your shoulder. You're going to do it all wrong. All the gymnastic mom and dads, like, you know, watch them try to do the thing. If you go try to do a backflip, you will never complete a backflip unless you abandon every sense of safety and security and go with it with your whole life and risk life and limb and a broken neck. Otherwise, if you bail midway, it's painful. Right, Jordan? <laughs> like, it's painful. That's what I'm talking about. 
That's what I'm like. You will never experience the full, bountiful, redemptive, meaningful, like life altering life of Jesus and his kingdom trying to like twist and turn your way in and out of it when it's more and less comfortable and convenient. I mean that with love. Like wholehearted is what God is coming after. So like you may be asking, that's great. It sounds really judgy actually, so I'm not sure it's great. But like what do, what do you even mean by wholehearted? What, what does a wholehearted life look like versus a half-hearted if you're trying not to thread some needle that it's all about checking boxes and, and religious behavior? And thank you for asking. That's a profound question, you guys. Like, I started to write a comparison list. Like, here's what a life of wholeheartedness looks like versus a life of half-heartedness looks like. And two things happened. The, la- the list got really quickly way too long. <laughs> and two, felt really harsh. Like, my tone, that felt like something we should do over coffee and in a conversation based on your life experiences. So I scratched it. And I opted for this. I want to give you three signs of what a wholehearted life with God looks like. This is the invitation, and then we're going to reflect on it in just a moment. The first is this. The first sign of a wholehearted life with God is that it is marked by repentance and reformation. And those are churchy words, Matt. What are you doing? You said you weren't going to... Like, this needs more teaching and framing like in the years to come. But bottom line, if you are apprenticing with Jesus... The Holy Spirit that God has deposited in your life, it, he is, it's, it's jealous for you. It wants your whole heart. The Holy Spirit wants your whole life. And then he is constantly seeking you, and he just wants your attention back. It's like a toddler. Toddler, Sydney, is constantly walking from room to room, trying like, Daddy, Daddy, watch this. Daddy, do this. Daddy, did you see this? And she's flipping on a trampoline now, wholeheartedly and with reckless abandon. But like, she's doing it, and she's just constantly vying for attention. The Holy Spirit inside of you is jealous for you because he loves you. He wants what's best for you. And the reality is that, do we rest, is it possible that, some of the lack of peace and unrest that we wrestle with is because the Holy Spirit won't let you have peace and rest if you're tolerating things that are associated with being half-hearted in your, in your life with God. The Holy Spirit may be provoking a lack of peace in you. Yes, he's the great peacemaker and he's their comfort, and that's true. Sometimes a path to comfort is through discomfort. So you can leave the way of discomfort in the past and have a lifelong, you see what I'm saying? Like, God is a jealous God. He's after your heart. And so one of the marks of a wholehearted life is that it has seasons and moments in life that are repentance. And then, like, reforming your life as a result of it. It's a rethinking of who you are and what you're doing for the purpose of, like, reorienting your entire life towards the heart of your heavenly Father. And here's your second, here's your second sign of wholeheartedness. It's that of dependence and prayer. Dependence and prayer. Here's, here's another way to think about what I mean here. It's like a posture of surrender versus a posture that's constantly gripping for control. Posture of surrender in life versus a posture that's gripping for control. And I don't know about you, but that's, that's a tension that I live with. <laughs> like, yes, God, I'm surrendered, but I also want a lot of control. And... Um, I need you to see it the way I do on the timeline that I do. And like, we're having really great staff meetings. And like, I don't know why two plus two equals equaling, equaling four yet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's this thing of a posture of surrender versus a posture gripping for control. Dependence and prayer. And what if prayer then, a life of prayer, simply becomes a conversation that puts language to your dependence on God? What if that's all prayer is? Prayer is like this thing that means everything and nothing for a lot of us, and it's intimidating. And I think all of us have our own tricky relationship with prayer. Lots of experiences and assumptions about what it is and what it isn't. We'll teach on it at some point. Like, is it, like when you approach it, do you find it boring or over the top or intimidating? Is it loud? Is it quiet, formal, informal, <laughs> public, private? And one, one tricky aspect of a relationship with prayer that I've always had is the fact that my brain just can't focus that much. Like, yes, I love God, but I can hardly hold a five-minute conversation with you sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, let's be honest. And, 
And I've always felt like this level, this level of distraction that I experienced, this tug of war between focusing on God and the stinking cell phone, wherever it is, or, or my wandering mind that's like taking a cheap bus tour of every thought I've ever had at the time I'm trying to pray. It's like, why when I try to talk to you, God, do I think of every life experience I've ever had in my entire life and every rabbit hole I want to go down? Anyone else relate? Like, Like, I used to think all that just made me like a really undevoted bad Christian who's a fake and like your love isn't actual. But in in the words of uh, a pastor that I follow, his name's Rich Velotis, he he talks about distractions in prayer and he says, one, it's just a sign that you're human. Welcome to the human experience. And two, it's an invitation. It's an an invitation to come back to the father that just wants to hold court with you, who just wants to know you. And what if every distraction is not a a temperature check on how good or bad you are, but it's an invitation to reconnect with the God that made you and that that loves you? Isn't that beautiful? And, And like beyond all of that, just wholeheartedness with God, it's marked by dependence and prayer. Half-heartedness is full of misguided effort. Wholeheartedness is sold out. It's full of inspiration and passion. Its energy is spent, but it is spent well towards God in submission to his plan and in his direction, not ours. And so we talked about stress and pressure for a second. When the pressure is up, the stress is up, do you go towards the way of dependence and prayer? Or do you go to the way of control and I got to fix this? It's just a good question. And the third mark of wholeheartedness is what we'll just call response and sacrifice. And there's an interesting principle at play here. When you are living a wholehearted life with God, you often live a life that doesn't fully make sense to other people. Your life invites questions. It looks curious. It is misunderstood. And here's the other thing it does. It rattles up the half-hearted folks. It rattles up the church folk. It rattles up the people that want things to stay as they are. It rattles, it provokes. And it kind of agitates people that are not looking to go wholeheartedly in. Have you ever, ever experienced that? And so response And sacrifice is a natural flow of wholeheartedness towards God. And so as we shift into this quick time of reflection before we go eat all the carbs and fat available to us through Hudson's Pizza and Farley's Root Beer, like, let's reflect on something different. (laughs) And I just want to ask this question, like, wholeheartedness, half-hearted, on the outside, working your way in, thinking through some things, just don't know yet. All of that is fine. All of that is welcome here. Just what, what is the state of your heart as we kick off this new year? What's the state of our hearts? And my prayer has been, like above so many things around here, as we quote unquote do church, as we are a church family, I want us to become a wholehearted church in 2022. A wholehearted church in 2022. A church that's marked by repentance and reformation, by dependence and prayer, by response and sacrifice. A church that is like eager to give our lives away for the sake of other people. Eager to make a difference in our world. Looking to find healing from our brokenness. Looking to be intellectually honest about our deep-seated questions about life and the Bible and faith and doubt and struggle. Looking to find something that we've never been able to find. Looking to find our identity restored and best understood by the one who made us. The church is expressing wholehearted worship and wholehearted generosity and wholehearted love in our serving and our hospitality with our entire lives. Like when you are wholehearted, we are wholehearted. And some of you, your best step towards wholeheartedness in your individual life will be giving wholeheartedly here. And in the last two years, I think we've all learned something. I think we've learned something about what it means to follow Jesus and be the church and belong somewhere through this pandemic. Let's be real for a second. I think the moral of the story of the last two years is that belonging to church, belonging to one another, being a church family will serve you better during crisis than simply going to church. 
Belonging is greater than attending. And that's not a judgment of those that haven't attended as much or where you are. It's just simply like the ultimate goal on your journey towards God and wholeheartedness is that not just that we show up, please show up and sit there for 20 years if that's your path to God. But at some point, God would say, belong, give your life, serve, don't consume, but contribute. Let your passions and everything flow into what it means to do this together. Serving, we've learned, is better than observing. Giving is greater than receiving. The invitation to go wholehearted towards God includes, it includes not just showing up, but showing out for God and for one another and for our community. And my question is, have you and I, have we taken a half-hearted approach to a whole and with a wholehearted God? Have we done that? The psalmist writes this, he says to God, for you are great and you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. And here's what he prays. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love towards me. It is God's love that stirs our hearts wholeheartedly to him. Like, like with love, again, just a half-hearted response to a wholehearted God is actually, it's not the thing. It's, it's not appropriate over the course of your life. The cross is not a half-hearted expression of love. The giving of the Holy Spirit is not a half-hearted self-help spirituality. Like God is all in on you and he spared no expense to get after and to come after your heart. So wholehearted, half-hearted, on the outside, still working your way. And believe me, we are here for it. Wherever you are, have you located where you are yet? Have you located yourself? Like, can you kind of in your mind's eye get into those recesses of your innermost being? And can you open up the doors of your heart and see what actually is hiding from room to room? Some rooms that have been tucked away for a long time and others that just popped up this year. And so as we shift into this time of reflection, I'm literally gonna invite you to pull out your phones as a tool of distraction. Um, not really. Pull out your phone if you want, get a pen and piece of paper, write some things that come to mind and let that be the launching pad for your own asking of God to check you in terms of wholeheartedness and half-heartedness and see how this new year can initiate a new season in your life because it is hard to know where to go unless you know where you are first. So to get you thinking in that direction, like take a moment and think like, what has impacted you the most this past year? What's robbed you of joy and peace and contentment? What has given you joy and peace and contentment? What's been a distraction to you? What's your relationship with technology been this past year? And Ask this question, it's okay to ask this, it's not selfish. What do you need? What do you need in this moment? What does your life need? What does your soul need? Can you locate yourself? So I wanna ask you four questions. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a slight pause in between to give you literally time to think about it. And if something comes to mind, write it down and come back to it later. First question is this. What are the spiritual practices that you need to anchor you in a wholehearted life with God? What are the spiritual practices that you need to anchor you into a wholehearted life with God? It could be silence. It could be a whole new relationship with technology. It could be solitude, prayer, fasting. It could be a practice of finding the rhythm of Sabbath and rest, the space to slow down, to think. It could be as simple as taking walks in nature so you can commune with God. It could be trying to add 20 more minutes to your day where you can play with your kids a little bit longer, find the joy that exists there. What are the spiritual practices you need to anchor you in a wholehearted life with God. What do you need? What do you need? 
The second question is this. What are the practices of self-care that you need to better care for your body? What are the practices of self-care that you need to better care for your body? And beyond things like eating and exercise, is for some of you there an invitation this year to step into therapy or counseling that you've put aside for years or decades? And that could be the breakthrough that you need for your mind and your body. Is there an invitation to paying attention to your mental health for the first time, to your relational health? Is there an invitation to rethink your life around not in terms of time management, but in terms of energy management, giving your best energy to the most important relationships and aspects of your life, rather than just finding time in your schedule for things. What are the practices of self-care you need to better care for your body? Because it is all related, my friends. Here's the third question. What core relationships do you need in this season of life to support you on your journey? What core relationships do you need in this life to support you on your journey? Are there relationships that need strengthened and mended? Are there relationships that need to turn the corner on forgiveness? Are there relationships that need restored? And at the same time, are there relationships that you need to put healthier boundaries around? What core relationships with God, with yourself, with others, with this world? What do you need? Who do you need? And here's the final question. What are the gifts and the passions, the burdens that God wants you to pay more attention to now for the sake of others? What are the gifts, the passions, the burdens that God wants you to pay attention to now for the sake of others? In other words, what has God put in your heart? What is your contribution to make to the world that God has uniquely gifted you and wired you and stuck you down in time and space in this moment of history to do? And so just before we go eat and we eat lunch together, I want to encourage you with one final thought. And this will probably become a teaching on its own in the, in the weeks or months to come. But there's a rule, in, there's an aviation rule. It's called the one in 60 rule. And it says that for every one degree you travel off course for 60 miles, you will land one mile from your intended destination. Just one degree. Make that two degrees, three degrees, and it can exponentially go up. And so when I think about wholehearted apprenticeship for us as individuals and being part of a wholehearted church, I want to double back and tell you that trajectory matters above everything. Direction matters the most. Behavior goes with it. What we do goes with it. But what I'm saying to you is that when we talk about wholeheartedness, We're talking about beginning with the end in mind, saying, God, what are you seeking? What are you doing? And then we dial the navigation of our lives in that direction. And we live in community and we live in teaching and we practice things and we do who we are, who we say we are. And then throughout life, through friendship and community and leadership and discipleship and worship and every expression of our life together, we have course corrections every day because this is a life long obedience it is a lifelong journey in the same direction and Jesus and his kingdom and his way is the end the end is not the behavior the end is God the end is worship the end is mission the end is purpose it's healing and God invites you not to get your stuff right but to bring your stuff to him he says don't get your marriage right before you can do anything he says bring your marriage to me bring your kids to me bring your identity to me bring your broken fragmented messed up self bring all your anxiety and your burdens and your anxiousness and your worry bring it to me bring all your questions and your doubts and your intellectual struggles with this whole bible and jesus and culture bring it to me 
get your trajectory aligned, get in friendship and community with people and course correct all the way. And the Holy Spirit has promised to be with us. We are not a church about your performance. God is not concerned with your performance first. He's concerned with the direction of your heart. And he says, bring it wholly to me and I will guide you and encourage you and love you and surround you with people that will encourage you on the journey. Bring your questions, bring your concerns, bring your doubts, but bring it all. I'm big enough. I can do it. I've done it before. It's kind of what I do. And I made you for it. So what do you need, guys? What do we need? What does your life need? It for sure needs you to give your whole heart to God and his way. Otherwise, we're going to be like spiritual toddlers trying to do backflips our whole life and just busting ourselves up. Healing is found in the reckless abandon to God. Purpose is found in the reckless abandon to God. Making a difference and seeing change and seeing our community flip upside down is found not in the safe, secure, planned out Excel spreadsheet approach to God. It is found in this radical reorientation of our entire lives around Him. And it begins with your heart. Begins with wholeheartedness of your heart. Some of you need your souls just to wake up from their dormancy and their hurt. This is the year to step into something that looks more like deliverance and inheritance than the desert that you've been walking around in for years and decades for some of you. It's the day to step across the line that says, I don't know what this looks like, God. I don't even know fully who you are and I don't know what difference it will make, but all I know is that there's nothing I've done that's made the difference. And I just see things crashing around me and I need you. I am so dependent on you. And this is my prayer to you, God. I'm at the end of myself. I need you. My marriage needs you. My kids need you. My life needs you. My finances need you. Like my thoughts need you. My behavior, my affections. I I just need you, God. What do you need? What do you need? What is God seeking? In a first allegiance and primary place in your life that God is seeking your heart. He's seeking all of it. And if we will give our whole hearts to a wholehearted God who's concerned about your whole life and the whole world, we will see something. You will see something. You will experience something. Step into it. Would you stand? Let's pray. God who made us and loves us and has offered us your whole heart, your whole life. God, provoke us, examine us, urge us, prompt us towards you. Whatever that step looks like for each individual and relationship and soul and question of mind, body, spirit that is represented in this room, God, we're not prescribing what that looks like. We're just saying we want to approach you. God, our trajectory is set on you. Course correct. Course correct. Give us people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who help us speak love and grace and truth to one another. Let our lives express what is on your heart because we are asking first what is on your heart. And then we're simply setting the dial of our lives in that direction. And we're looking for change, but we're also looking for a lifelong pursuit here, God. And it is up and downs and it's turbulence and whatever. I'm going to quit that metaphor before I get lost. God, here here we are. Here we are. And we love you. We thank you for what you want to do in our lives in 2022 and for the decades to come. Bring us together and give us a renewed sense of hope and a clearer, brighter, more spirit-filled vision of our future together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.